Okay, hi friends. We go for a April month yojana. In that, we are going to see the topics: fintech beyond boundaries, digital identity, fintech revolution, artificial intelligence in financial sector, rural banking, and financial services. So, in this first article is uh, fintech beyond boundaries. So, before going to this concept of fintech, fintech's expansion is financial technologies. So, first we need to understand the term technology and how it is important for our society. So, technology is mostly driven based on innovation, innovation in products or process. All we call it as uh, uh, the major driver of driver of technology. <coughs> and we can see that since our independence, technology has played a major role in our development of a society. Either it can be social or economic development, technology played a major role in it. To give a few instances of it, uh, after independence, we can see that uh, Indian system adopted technology in agriculture sector, starting with uh, high yielding varieties, fertilizers, pump sets for irrigation purpose. That's a few example in 1960s where we used our technology for our development. <clears throat> From there, if you go for 80s, 70s, and 80s, where Indian system used technology which is more focused on uh, <coughs> mass communication. Either it can be television or telephone, which is being uh, used in India. In 1990s, right now we have 1990s and 2000s. We have this IT revolution, <coughs> which is a technology used by India for its development. This, which includes public players and private players. <coughs> so, in that direction, right now in 20, 2000, after 2000, right now we are in 2020s. Right now, the new emerging technologies, <coughs> fin technology. So, that is what the topic is. So, in that first one is fintech beyond boundaries. So, we go for paragraph 1 on paragraph 2 and even a good example of understanding fintech is uh, right now we have a lot of apps in our mobile phones to understand this fintech and uh, these apps helps in financial decisions, helps in financial behaviors that all comes under fintechs, very basic common man understanding. So, with that background we can go for these articles. So, in paragraph 1. So, we can see that uh, right now government of India, so that is government of India under PPP model, that is public private partnership model. Name itself says for any development activities, how government and private players are combining together for a development, that is called PPP model. So, in this PPP model, especially based on fintech, so we have this India stack. This we need to understand. So, what is this India stack is uh, it is a basic platform on which we can see our development in fintech is happening. So, in later article we can see that. So, very common man understanding of uh, uh, India stack is creating the basic platform for our financial technologies to develop. So, this results in private sector innovations. Because of this PPP model, we have India has developed its stack so that it results in private sector innovations happening a lot. And uh, they are, so they have given approaches. There are four approaches of uh, so India stack. So in that first one is uh, regarding so Pradhan Mandri Jan Jandan Yojana. So it's a government scheme where it primary focuses creating bank bank accounts for Indians. So, this is also a good example of financial inclusion. So, creating a bank account for every Indian, so they can be integrated in the financial world. So, that is the first uh, approach. And second one is uh, integrated IMPS, integrated uh, payment services. So, we, here we can see that uh, right now payments are done through this particular platform IMPS, which we all, uh, we all clearly know and UPA, Unified Payment Interface. This we use as a common man a lot in our present day life. This second one, which all comes in the India stack. And third one is uh, regarding a uh, Bharat bill payment system. So, right now we can see that uh, financial transaction, especially in uh, goods and all, we can see this playing a major role. Then, apart from this, we also have this uh, GST network and DigiLocker. So, these are a few basic on which the India stack is being built. As I already said, it is a platform on which a uh, lot of private sectors are innovating on financial technology. These platforms are created by these set of 
initiatives and you can see mostly it's all driven by the government so government created the basic platform on which right now financial technologies are emerging so and mostly we have used all of these platforms in our life so this is the first paragraph and second paragraph second paragraph uh, it says about uh, india's uh, fastest growing fintech market so fastest growing fintech market so it's nothing but a uh, lot of people are using financial pro fintech products in india and they have given some factual statement that is uh, right now in india we have around uh, 2100 fintechs are there and uh, this is after uh, us and china after us and china and we know that by this fa fact there are some understanding we can relate it so we know that us and china are the largest economies then india stands third so even this fintechs play a major role in our economic development so as these economies us and china has the largest concentration of fintechs india is standing in th th third if you are able to promote this fintech in future that can also propel in uh, economic development okay so and another important facts are given so this is related to india so fintech our option is around 87 percentage are in global level so global level the same thing is around uh, 64 percentage this clearly shows that how our indian economy is uh, ready for new technologies and uh, around 87 percentage uh, uh, adop adoption rates are there or uh, simple to say that as a common man we see that once the google pay came or pay atm uh, came into our life we are ready to accept it and use for our transactions there is a few way of understanding it this clearly shows that indian people and indian market is ready to adopt new technologies so adopt adoption rate is very high so around 60 64 percentage global level and another important factor is uh, in india around 17 companies or fintech companies so 17 fintech companies comes under unicorn status so unicorn is a term used in capital markets or popularly called as share markets if any company has a valuation valuation of uh, us dollar 1 billion they come under this unicorn status what this valuation means assume that if someone is want to buy the company and they want to buy uh, they want to uh, uh, pay 1 billion dollar so that type of companies are called unicorn so they have the worth of 1 billion dollars recently we have seen that elon musk purchased the uh, uh, twitter so he paid some 40 billion dollars for it so if that same thing happens for a fintech company with 1 billion dollar or any company with 1 billion dollar they call as uni unicorns and what are the facts is in india right now we have 17 fintechs in unicorn status their valuation is around 1 billion so that is the point we need to understand this is given in paragraph 2 and uh, next thing is paragraph 3 5 and 6 so in paragraph 3 and uh, so right now they say that uh, based on the previous page uh, so india's market will grow around 50 to 60 billion in uh, financial year 2020 is uh, go, uh, expect to grow by 150 billion so so they say that by 2025 the fintech market so fintech market will grow for 150 billion dollars so there's a huge potential right now this current position of uh, uh, that market size is around uh, so dollar 50 to 60 billion so we can see that there are other three uh, another three time uh, possibility is there so right now it's a 50 billion dollar another three times the market can grow that is a great potential for lot of fintech companies in india these are the data from which we can understand all this uh, informations and uh, next thing is paragraph 4 which speaks about uh, digital public infrastructure so from the name itself says digital public infrastructure so right now we when you say infrastructure means either we can relate with physical and social infrastructures what is physical infrastructure it can be road network rail network social infrastructure can be education health similarly we have this new idea called digital public infrastructure and this uh, paragraph clearly says that uh, 
will never have this digital public public infrastructures that results in digital inclusion. This results in digital inclusion. And right now for our development, digital inclusion is one important criteria. So and now people are digitally included. So that results in a lot of socio-economic benefits. So digital public infrastructure plays a major role in digital inclusion. And uh, especially this results in solving problems of the nation, solving problems of the nation. So uh, solving problems in the nation can be easily addressed through digital public infrastructure. We will see some example for it, it will be very easy to understand it. So this digital and th there comes the concept of digital public goods. When you create this digital public infrastructure, next thing is digital public goods. And what constitute digital public goods is uh, open source software. So open source software and open AI models artificial intelligence models and uh, open data. So what is this term open means it is in a common platform, it is not a proprietary one. So when you create this open uh, source softwares and uh, open uh, artificial intelligence model that all comes under pu digital public goods which can be used in pub digital public infrastructure and what are the I importance of these two things is you are able to solve the nation problems. And a great example for this is given in paragraph. Uh, uh, this is paragraph 5 in given in paragraph 6. What paragraph 6 says is uh, Coven portal. So Coven portal is a good example of digital public good. So we can relate this with uh, paragraph uh, 4 and 5. So a good example is a Coven uh, portal and we have created digital public infrastructure and digital public good and uh, with this we can able to address the problem of uh, Corona pandemic under this COVID portal, we are able to uh, use it very effectively to control this pandemic. So, this points we can easily understand based on this uh, example that is given in paragraph 6. Another most important thing is India is also a nation which shared this COVID portal that is nothing but open source software with other countries. So, they have given to uh, World Health Organization and UN, which can be given to Africa, mostly African countries. They can use this. Uh, uh, technology for vaccines and all those things. So this, this is a point which we need to understand from paragraph 6. And paragraph 7. So in paragraph 7 we saw in this article the term called India, India stack. So right now there is another term called global stack. So like India global level also we can create such a platform. So that is given global stack and that was identified in IMF, International Monetary Fund, Bali Fintech Ajanta in 2018. So in that there was a talk on this uh, global stack. So they have even said that Fintech beyond boundaries, Fintech beyond boundaries. So what we can understand from this is uh, right now in global level also they are aspiring to create uh, common platform across the world, so which can be effectively used for people's well-being. Okay. And also there is a discussion on this in India also. So right now Aadhaar that is given in the next pa paragraph, there is Aadhaar 2.0, Aadhaar 2.0 and Aadhaar is a uh, platform which is given to every Indian that is unique ID. So there is a uh, discussion going on how Aadhaar can be effectively used in uh, digital world and uh, say they have given a title called Aadhaar as International Digital Identity Standard. So this can be, this Aadhaar can be used in international arena also. So creating international identity. So this, this is all related to global stack. So this is given in paragraph 7, okay. That is called international, uh, international identity and uh, international identity here is international digital identity that you need to understand. Okay, so this uh, next uh, article is digital identity. So we know that uh, identity for a uh, individual is always done by the government, and mostly by by means of documents, by means of uh, ID cards given. So in that direction, right now, as technologies are emerging in the uh, global level, so digital identity is another most important identity. So in that, we go for paragraph one. 
and paragraph two. So in paragraph one, so first they'll speak. Uh, this poet has given about Adar. So Adar was introduced in India by in, in the year of two thousand nineteen. Two thousand sorry, two thousand nine, and uh, and this related to one point three billion population. That is creating unique ID. So under Aadhaar, every Indian citizen or anyone in India can get this unique ID. So, so that is uh, they started in the year of 2009. And next thing is 2014. These are all related to creation of this digital identity. So in 2014, we had this Jandan Initiative. So the Jandan Initiative. So the Jandan Initiative is for financial inclusion. is for financial inclusion so this is a program primarily focused on creating bank accounts so for every indian need to have a bank account so that is the primary objective of this uh, jandan initiative that is what in 2014 uh, it was created and the uh, last most important thing is they call it as jam trinity what is jam trinity is combining the three factors one is jandan yojana another thing is aadhar one is jandan aadhar and last one mobile so this we called as uh, jam trinity so as a common man when they have all these three so they are digitally included in a development process a common man having a mobile number having aadhar and having a bank account ultimately he is being digitally identified and that helps in his socio economic development so that's called jam trinity and uh, so another important aspect is uh, so they also given the fact that 80 percentage of indians have bank accounts right now so 80 percentage of indians have bank accounts this we need to compare with uh, Uh, creation of this jandan yojana until 2014 if you go and check the uh, data in india how many indians who have bank account so it was around 30 percentage of indian approximately have a bank account since the independence right from 1950 to 2013 so only 30 percentage of indians uh, factual you need we need to check either from 30 to 40 percentage got the bank account but with this initiative within 8 uh, years we are able to reach to 80 percentage of indians have a bank account okay so that is there And another thing is apart from this, there is another initiative called Aadhar Payment Bridge. The name itself says, so based on Aadhar, how we are able to provide the payment. So that was done by National Payment Corporation of India. So this is an organization which is responsible for this, uh, especially for uh, cash transfers, especially for cash transfers. and where this cash transfers are mostly happening is uh, regarding this benefits given by the government they have given the fact also so especially we take this union government under this aadhar payment bridge there is a direct transfer direct cash benefit transfer we popularly call it as dcbt so dcbt so they have given the fact that under this around 37 314 grams and schemes of union government where money is being directly transferred to the beneficiaries and if we go for state governments it's around 450 programs so we can see that how this uh, digital identity helps in uh, helps in government reaching the beneficiaries so all based on this aadhar uh, enabled uh, payment systems okay so that is given in paragraph 2 this is in paragraph 2 next thing is paragraph 3 paragraph 4 so in paragraph 3 which speaks about uh, application programming interfaces so application programming interfaces so once we create this uh, basic uh, platforms and right now we have a lot of other initiatives in india so one is this upi 
unified payment interface which you already saw in the previous article. Apart from this we have this uh, Bharat interface for money BIM even we have an app for this Bharat uh, uh, interface for money and QR codes QR codes for payments. We can see in mostly in uh, as a common man we can see this lot in our uh, life when you go for a, a shop and all they have this uh, QR codes where we can scan it and pay it. So QR codes is there and apart from this uh, we have a lot of other initiatives like DigiLocker to store your document electronically and also electronic KYC norms and uh, Bharat bill payments system and also Aadhaar enabled payment system. So you can see all these things are possible especially after we creating this India stack and also it creates a digital identity for individuals. So by, by based on Jam Trinity as an individual you can enjoy all these things because of a digital identity for a citizen. Okay. So that's given, these are initiatives in India especially for uh, 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 digitally empowered citizens. Okay. And we have this paragraph 4. So right now uh, they have given this Aadhaar as a background or Aadhaar is the basis on which right now all these APIs are linked. Aadhaar, based on Aadhaar all these APIs are linked resulting in digital evolution. So res resulting in digital evolution of the country and also fo focusing on digital foundation. That is what paragraph 4 says. So Aadhaar along with this application programming interfaces that creates a digital evolution and people are moving towards the uh, digitally empowered society and also for, uh, for creating the digital foundation for our development. Okay. Next thing is uh, paragraph 5 that speaks about Aadhaar enabled payment systems. Aadhaar enabled payment systems. So what are the basic things based on this we, we can see is uh, one is cash withdrawal so cash withdrawal and balance checking, balance checking. So all these are being provided uh, at doorstep. So this we can see especially most effectively in rural India because Aadhaar acts as a ID for in every individual and Aadhaar is a unique one. So based on that people can enjoy these services especially in rural India that is given in uh, paragraph 5 and also they related this because of other enabled payment system pandemic especially from financial point of view is able to be properly addressed because of other enabled payment systems okay so that's going in paragraph 5 next we go for the next article fintech revolution so that's paragraph 1 paragraph 2 and paragraph 3 so in this uh, so they have given some basic facts in uh, uh, in this uh, news articles. First one is uh, regarding uh, so we will have some key metrics or key indicators in that first one is uh, regarding uh, India that is 834 million internet users. So what the fact says is out of 1.3 billion population around 834 million population is using internet and second is uh, and UPA transactions unified payment interface transactions is around 416 million. This numbers just for understanding it is not to be very precise while writing answers just based on this facts you can substantiate your answers. And uh, and ma major reason why fintech revolution is happening in India is fintech revolution because of population population size. So India's population size is very high and people are ready to adopt the technology. Right now we can see fintech revolution is happening a lot in India. And uh, and also they have given other thing is uh, other uh, thing is digital payments. So digital payments has increased when compared with 2003, 160 times. So in 2003 most of the transaction in uh, payment was done through hard currencies. By two, uh, from, uh, when compared to 2022 it has improved 160 times. 
so so that clearly shows that how we are uh, uh, using technology and how technology has a potential to transform the economy and also by 2025 another data says that it will create 26 lakh jobs 26 lakh jobs and uh, and it has a worth of 2.8 lakh crore in economic value so these are the data being projected for 2025 if your fintech is properly utilized these are the benefits we can arrive on is 26 lakh jobs and 2.8 lakh crore uh, worth of economic value so that is the point we need to understand next thing is paragraph 2 so in paragraph 2 so already they have given this uh, we have seen in the previous article one is uh, jandan yojana pradhan mandri jandan yojana which is uh, the world's largest financial inclusion initiative the financial inclusion initiative financial inclusion initiative and next thing is uh, we have this uh, e rupee that is regarding payment cashless payment cashless payment by being predicted and also we have this uh, bim upi so uh, until July 2021, the data what it says is around uh, 3.2 billion transactions. And as per uh, during pandemic situation also, as people are not going out and uh, because of um, uh, mobile phones and Jam Trinity and a lot of fintechs uh, app available, we can see most of the transactions are happening through this. And some facts, uh, the fact is around 3.2 billion transactions. Okay, and. Uh, fast tag is another one especially when you go for this uh, uh, national highways payment is done through fast tag right now there is no need for giving uh, hard currencies so banks are being taken into fold of the under fast tag once they have you have a sticker on the car you can pass through the uh, toll gates that also comes under this uh, fintech initiatives okay and also we have this uh, and they have given some numbers for this that is 192 million transactions the fast tag and another thing is uh, we have this umang app so umang app also provide a one stop platform and uh, it has witnessed around 1.7 billion transactions and what is Umang app is uh, it's regarding a uh, unified mobile application for new age governance where most of the government departments especially at union level and state level provide the services and this also resulted in transactions where you pay the fees and all those things so these are the data which you can use it for your answer writing regarding fintech in india how it has a potential and how it ha what has have done until 2021 next thing is paragraph 3 Four, five, six. So in paragraph three, so what they have said is uh, this uh, factor of authentication, additional factor of authentication. So authentication and uh, through pin, through pin or OTP. So it's a way, uh, we, it seems to be very technical, but very common man term is whenever we do a financial transaction, we can get a message, correct? From a bank or any uh, uh, fintech app, we have this OTP, one time password, or we have this PIN. So this is considered to be one of the biggest Indian innovation in financial world. So Indian innovation in financial world. So India has its own reason why they want to develop all these things because uh, in India uh, still people are not tech savvy and people doesn't know how to use technology to safeguard the people from this uh, uh, cyber crimes and malpractices. Uh, in India we innovated this concept of OTP. Right now for global level this is the biggest contribution of India in India's innovation to financial world. Okay, So that is given in paragraph 3 and paragraph 4. So, paragraph 4 and uh, so we have this uh, digital payments. So, there are different time phase of digital payments. Uh, first, we will start with digital payment 1.0. 
this was the time period of 2010 where we can see this uh, RTGS still we can see in banks we are using this RTGS that is uh, real time gross settlements so where this was the first uh, starting point of digital payment in India that was in 2000 that that is called digital payment 1.0 from there we can see how we are transforming in India okay so next thing is uh, so digital payment uh, 2.0 so 2.0 that happened in post 2011 this is mainly based on mobile technology penetration that is when our mobile technology moved towards fourth generation starting with third generation and fourth generation that resulted in emergence of digital payment 2.0 where we began to use mobile phones lot for financial transactions that is there the next thing is digital payment so 3.0 that is uh, 2016 in 2016 where this started especially the major reason for this thing is demonetization when indian government went for demonetization what is demonetization is uh, removing the currency value of 1000 uh, rupees uh, from circulation or removing it from legal tender and primary objective given by the government is for uh, elimination of corruption but the biggest positive impact of this is uh, we can see that our economy moving towards digital payments so that is a very positive thing that is digital payment 3.0 that was the third one and next thing is uh, so paragraph okay paragraph 7 8 9 10 11 and 12 so in paragraph 7 so again they have given the basic data uh, so based on that uh, right now after demonetization and uh, that propelled our economy towards digital economy and they have again given some facts which you already seen in the previous article that is by december 2021 there are 17 fintech startups fintech startups and uh, which comes at a unicorn club we saw unique what is unicorn means unicorn club and uh, and uh, ultimate funding of around so all this have a funding value of uh, 20 point 27.6 billion so uh, and sector all sector consists of there are 17 companies with this 1 billion uh, valuation and also there are a lot of investment around 27 billion dollars in this particular fintech startups in india so there's a fact given and uh, and also we have the real time payments so real time payments oh these are technical terms but a common man understanding is so, uh, we are using mobile phones for financial transaction that is around uh, 25.5 billion in 2020 in various platforms starting with google pay paytm and uh, uh net banking all combined all this is around 25.5 billion in 2020 is a huge market in financial uh, fin, uh, fintech uh, fintech world okay the next thing is uh, in paragraph 8 they speak about this uh, digital payment 4.0 so digital payment 4.0 it's primarily focusing on this is the next stage not evolved it next stage so not evolved and they say that it's around it's more focused on low cost solutions where this digital payment can be effectively used by everyone yeah, in the society and uh, they have given some numbers for it and uh, so by 2025 so digital payment will reach to the level of uh, 54000 crore and uh, especially focused on how this becomes is based on digital commerce so what we use uh, amazon all comes under this and personalized solutions personalized solutions and uh, digital convergence so digital convergence so right now we can see that lot of apps are uh, being created starting with one solution and finally they began to scale up So uh, take example of Paytm we have a wallet we can buy the uh, certain things and also a lot of other financial aspects of life are taken care and also regulatory innovation 
So these are the ways how to achieve this uh, 54,000 crore digital transaction, digital payments by 2025. And also, it's a paragraph 9. And uh, so they have given some data. Uh, so they have given said India, which accounts for 2.2 percentage of US dollar 12 trillion digital payment. So when you take global level digital payment, the value is around 12 trillion dollars. In that 2.2 percentage is contributed by India. Uh, so digital payments by 2023, they are projecting by 2020, this will be a contribution and uh, and they say that by 2025, this is all related to India, by 2025, there will be 95 percentage of financial inclusion. So nearly 95 percentage of financial inclusion or all segments, all segments and uh, and 25 lakh crore will be contributed by MSME digitalization. So these are all projections. If you go for digital economy, this is all related to digital economy. When India focus on digital economy, so what are the projections for India? So uh, by 2023, 2 percentage of global 12 trillion dollar uh, uh, digital payments will be done in India and around 95 percentage of uh, financial inclusion will happen in all segments. All segments consisting of people, corporates and in that they have given this MSME sector digitalization which has a potential to add 25 lakh crores to GDP. So this is related to GDP. So these are some of the data which we need to understand here and uh, in paragraph 10. So but all this need to happen, there are certain conditions required. What are those conditions? First and foremost thing is uh, fraud management. So when you want to achieve all these things, there should be a proper infrastructure for fraud management. We know this uh, cyber crime is a evolving crime in global level and especially in India. And to tackle that, we need to have this proper for fraud management and effective use of new technologies. So along with other technologies, there should be a greater concentration of blockchain, blockchain, geofencing, geotagging. These are all potential plums question. We need to go and check what is blockchain, what is geofencing and what is geotagging. All this need to be checked properly and also QR code. So technology should be levered to achieve this uh, digital economy objective and also in paragraph uh, 11, so they also focus on this uh, mass so adoption of digital payments. So this need to be done, though India is uh, going towards digital payments, still we need to encourage people, especially merchants and we need to create this uh, KYC policy for uh, customers and merchants, that need to be done. So that results in uh, uh, greater digital economy and also focusing on infrastructures. So digital infrastructures, so digital infrastructures need to be strengthened in rural areas and also in tier 3 cities of urban areas that is given there especially in rural and tier 3 cities that need to be strengthened that is given in paragraph 1 and finally last one uh, the potential of uh, global collaboration so we can see that uh, India and Singapore. So India and Singapore is trying to integrate this uh, UPA, Unified Payment Interface in India and PayNow, that's Singapore initiative, into a single platform which will be a seamless financial transaction between India and Singapore. So a good way of understanding is if you are in Singapore and uh, as a tourist or if you are an employee in Singapore belonging to India and right now we can see there is a process involved to transfer the money to India. But if these are being integrated, there is a greater seamless flow of uh, uh, money across uh, India and Singapore. So that is being the in paragraph 12. Okay. Next we go for artificial intelligence in financial sector. So, so in this we go for paragraph 1. So what paragraph 1 says is uh, regarding, uh, so there is a projection by 2026. 
financial transaction india financial transaction in india will be through payment gateways payment gateways and aggregators what be the level is 44 percentage if rupees 100 is trans, uh, transacted in india 44 rupees by 2026 is through this payment gateways or this aggregators so aggregators are nothing but google pay paytm and payment gateways like a upa all this comes into picture so that's the data given there and 34 percentage will be through qr codes as we go for a uh, grocery shop where, where we can see that uh, we pay based on this qr code scanning a code and paying the money that is will be around 34 percentage and uh, around 22 percentage will be based on point of sale so point of sale is nothing but uh, we use our uh, debit cards to pay our uh, money in grocery shop so that'll be a machine where we swipe the card so all these are the things which clearly shows that uh, digital transaction is going to enhance lot in india that's given paragraph 1 and paragraph 2 3 4 5 5 so are you go for paragraph 2 so right now we have this ai artificial intelligence that's the title of the article so artificial intelligence the greatest uh, advantage is used for fraud detection or fraud prevention so the common man understanding of artificial intelligence as a humans we make decisions right now we can use machines to make it Uh, to uh, from a common man point so this can be effectively used for fraud prevention especially in uh, financial world and uh, and also so because how this is able to uh, focus on uh, fraud prevention is they are able to understand the pattern so fraud pattern can be easily identify based on artificial intelligence so ultimately for take an example if there is some person uh, Uh, evading a taxes so they have some uh, uh, shady way of giving accounts so ultimately what happens when you use artificial intelligence by learning that one case study and uh, the machine can understand that these are the patterns followed for tax evasion this is how accounting practice will be ultimately this knowledge can be used in other tax uh, uh, documents of the government so ultimately it can easily identify the fraudulent practices so just for a common man understanding so fraudulent prevention and fraud pattern can be easily understood through ai and it is said that uh, by 2020 so us dollar of 56 billion us dollar of 56 billion is you lost through online frauds so online frauds and uh, this amount this is equivalent to 42 lakh crore if you want to put in indian value indian currency it's around so we can see that around 42 lakh crore is lost in uh, online frauds across the world so ultimately we can use ai to detect the frauds and what are some of the examples are like uh, ransomware and these are some of the potential prelims question can be asked in science and technology you need to go and check what are different types of cyber crimes you need to what is no cy ransomware all this we need to understand it okay so ransomware especially focused on financial sectors and especially banks so where we can use ai to find identify this fraudulent pattern and able to warn the particular banks or our regulators ultimately they make a, make they can make some corrective actions so that is paragraph 3 paragraph 4 so right now we have this chatbots a cubed with ai so this is another most important thing so most of our banks right now as a common man whenever we go, we call the banks we feel that someone is answering but it's always a chat box so because of common pattern of questions are being asked this ai based on artificial intelligence they are able to identify what is the pre- primary requirement of the customers and they are able to address the uh, question properly that's called chat boxes a cubed with ai so it's a better service to the consumers so there's the potential of ai and uh, so there are how this ai works is based on analyzing analyzing the pre existing datas 
so pre existing data and able to answer the questions. Very basic understanding is uh, as a common at the end of the month we know what should be in our account, what is the money in our account come at the end of the month or uh, after every transaction we want to know or what transaction we have done. So by understanding all these things, by understanding customer specific needs, AI can give the solutions to us. Okay. So even some expenditure patterns all be easily identified. So that's given paragraph 4 and paragraph 5. The greatest benefit is uh, it can use for millions of users. This chat box powered by AI can uh, simultaneously able to address the uh, issues of millions of users and especially focusing on general doubts. So this increases the customer satisfaction. Customer satisfaction. So that's given in uh, uh, paragraph 5. So we go for the next article, Rural Banking and Financial Services, so paragraph 1. 2, 3. In paragraph 1, it speaks about BharatNet. It's a broadband. So, BharatNet is an infrastructure. So, broadband connectivity. To digitally connect India, especially for rural areas, this BharatNet is a program for laying optic fiber connectivity to villages. So, that comes under this uh, Bharat net and uh, it resulted in 13,000 terabytes of data consumption. So, based on this Bharat net by 2021, this much amount of data is used especially in India focusing on rural areas. This clearly shows that internet penetration is good in India and rural India is also well connected. So, so digital financial services, so digital financial services is able to penetrate into rural India because of this initiative and this data clearly shows that. And the next thing is paragraph 2, so it speaks about uh, the concept of banking correspondent. So, banking correspondent, popularly call it as BC. So, this is a this is a this is a group of people, especially educated rural youths, who are acting as a connecting point between rural citizen and banking systems, and they are able to provide all the services of banks, especially through digital medium. And this banking correspondent acts as a connecting node between a common man and bank. So, they play a major role in digitally empowering rural areas. So, rural areas, so they are considered to be the agents of the bank. So, agents of the bank and for providing banking services like depositing money, withdrawing money. So, they have the handheld devices, they take banks to the doorsteps. So, that is the basic idea of this and uh, and this especially prob, uh, is possible because of this jam trinity again. So, Jandan Yojana, Aadhaar and Mobile, because of all these things, we have this banking correspondent linking with banks and providing the banking service digitally to the rural Indians. And in 2017, we have this digital empowerment foundation. So, Digital Empowerment Foundation. So, they in collaboration with banking correspondents, they in collaboration with banking correspondents, increasing digital financial literacy, especially in rural areas. So, Digital Empowerment Foundation along with banking correspondents is increasing digital financial literacy, uh, especially in rural areas. Rural areas, okay. And uh, so, this, this Digital Empower Foundation has created around 2000 two digital, these are all infrastructures created in India, resource centers, resource centers and that are being run by, so this is a key term which you want to use in your answer writing.
So, Suchna Paras, this is, I think it is a Hindi term. So, uh, another term for this is information entrepreneurs. So, these are all possible because of digital foundation providing digital literacy and also they create digital resource centers creating uh, entrepreneurs based on digital world that is uh, through information entrepreneurs and they act as a banking correspondents. So, this is the ba background which we need to understand this paragraph 3, I think it is paragraph 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8. So, paragraph 4 which says why banking correspondence is important for uh, rural India around a 20 percentage of ATMs. This 100 ATM only 20 ATMs are rural in India and we need to understand that uh, uh, around 60 percentage of Indians are in rural India. So, we can see the proportion. So, out of 100 people around uh, 60 to 70 percentage are in rural India but number of ATMs out of 100 only 20 are in rural areas. So, there you can see the mismatch. Large number of people in rural area but banking services cannot be provided because ATMs are not there. So, with this background we can understand the importance of banking correspondent and they found out that uh, this BC means banking correspondent. Uh, so, they will they will banking correspondent. So, they are the major link between people and banks people and banks especially rural masses and banks and they also withdraw money for people from ATM and give the money back to them. So, that is given in paragraph 4 and Aadhaar enable payment systems, Aadhaar enable payment systems helps for them to provide the services especially for the common man ok. And uh, so, they have given some examples of the banking correspondence experiences that is given in all this paragraph and also in paragraph 5 and uh, so uh, if you take this banking correspondence they are also able to address the safety concerns as a common man as a common especially in rural India not tech savvy and they are also have a problem of uh, security dimensions because of this uh, uh, digital transactions digital transactions enabled by banking correspondents, they are able to address the safety problems. So, uh, that is already we saw that OT, uh, uh, one time password and pin generation all this helps in securely giving a financial transactions that is given in paragraph 5. These are a few examples how digital transaction along with banking correspondents able to empower rural masses in financial world. So, that is given in paragraph 5, safety concerns are properly addressed because of banking correspondents coupled with uh, digital transactions and paragraph 6 and uh, anytime, anywhere transactions. So, right now it is not that they need a uh, common man physically want to visit the bank to uh, get the financial services through banking correspondence anytime. So, anytime means at any point of time there is no requirement of office hours even after evening hours. 5, 7 or 8 if a banking correspondence is available rural masses can enjoy the banking services they can deposit the money because other enabled OT of uh, OT, uh, OTP is there and also all these are being recorded. So, that is one and anywhere anywhere is nothing but even in the middle of the field if banking correspondence is available they can enjoy the banking services. So, that is given in paragraph 6 and paragraph 7. Uh, so, it also creates uh, transparency because of digital transaction everything is recorded and banking correspondents can easily show all these things what is happening once the money is being deposited gets reflected in the account as a common man they are able to understand all these things that is another advantage that is another example given by a banking correspondent and uh, so transparency in account balance because common man began to believe the system very well because everything is very transparent and digitally uh, visible. So, account balance can be easily understood. So, that is one that is given in paragraph 7. So, this result in digital financial citizenship because of all these things one banking correspondence says resulting in digital financial citizenship. 
that is given paragraph 7 and paragraph 8. Uh, so, this helps especially for old age people because there is no need for travel, no need for travel especially for pensions, physical trips are being eliminated. So, these are some of the benefits under banking correspondent model for rural India for financial services that is given paragraph 8 and paragraph 9, 10, 11, 12, 14, 15 and 16. So, in paragraph uh, 9. So, one for old age people there is no requirement of uh, physical visiting a bank and also not need to focus on lot of complicated procedures, no complicated procedures because all, the, all based on digital transaction and other enabled ok. And also they have a foolproof system because uh, their fingerprints are required for transactions. So, all this results in secure transaction that is given in paragraph 10 and paragraph 11. So, where we can see that especially during COVID QR code based transactions helped a lot especially to stop the spread of COVID and uh, payment receivement, payment received especially for uh, small entrepreneurs. So, these are the other benefits. So, ultimately we can see that uh, how it benefiting the every rural masses through digital transactions and uh, so that is given in paragraph 11 and 12 how this QR enabled all this and uh, banking correspondent helps in uh, physical uh, uh, boundary maintain for uh, stop of pandemic ok and blocking the chain of spread of pandemic. And uh, paragraph 13, but there are some challenges that are given in challenges though we have all these things there are still, still challenges need to be taken care. One is regarding this uh, basic infrastructures which need to be strengthened, this comes under all under challenges. So, basic infrastructures need to be strengthened when you want to promote digital India and paragraph uh, 14 and also we need to have grievance redressal. So, even though we have all this uh, uh, technologies still people have some challenges and all those uh, problems need to be addressed. So, there should be a proper grievance redressal mechanism, mechanism need to be strengthened, need to be strengthened. Paragraph 15 is uh, online frauds which is another one which need to be taken care. So, online frauds need to be taken care though people are using this uh, digital platform still they are illiterate, digital literacy is very low. So, there is a chance of uh, online frauds that need to be taken care that is given in paragraph uh, 15 and paragraph 16. Uh, so, we can see that how uh, male dominated system and where bank accounts or used by husbands. We know that most of the government transactions in a family happens with the female. So, all government schemes are uh, addressed towards female of the family especially wife of the family. But in reality when we go and check in rural India all these are being done on the name of female under the by male either can be husband or a father or a son they will be enjoying all the things which is being targeted on women. So, that is another biggest challenge because under digital empower, digitally empowered services the primary objective of the government is focusing on disadvantaged people. Take uh, in Indian perspective from gender perspective it is always women, women need to be strengthened by the system especially government, but this being hijacked by the male. So, it is a cultural preferences that is given in paragraph uh, 16 and paragraph 17. Nineteen, twenty, and twenty-one. So in paragraph seventeen, so that's they said about this patriarchal norms. So patriarchal norms, 
patriarchal norms if you want to put in common man term is male dominated system so even though we create all these things for uh, disadvantage especially women still we can see that male enjoying all the things so uh, so in digital independence is not being enjoyed by women so digital independence no for women so that is given in paragraph 17 paragraph 18 there are some challenges these are common challenges of the uh, model then there are certain challenges very specific to banking correspondence so the very basic specific to uh, bank banking correspondence is uh, not financially incentive banking correspondence cannot rely this one job for their survival it's not financially incentive for banking correspondence ultimately they do lot of other allied activities outside of this banking correspondence so that is also biggest challenge for them so they want to run their own businesses along with that they do banking correspondence ultimately you can see that the concentration on this initiative will go down so that is the given in pay, paragraph 18 and paragraph 19 so banking correspondence also face the problem of uh, charges charges and levies and banking correspondence what they say one experience of bank correspondent is uh, as a ma as a rural people sometimes uh, they'll give the money to bank correspondent to deposit into their account which need to be done from their account sometimes this also happens so what uh, ultimately what the bank correspondent says is if they don't have a bank account on that particular bank where the uh, the customer need or where the common man need to transact the money so when he transacts from his account which is another bank he need to pay the uh, charges he says this is a negative incentive so where he is paying the charges on the behalf of the common man so they are not inclined towards such such, such type of transaction this is another challenge they are saying so especially in rural areas we can see sometimes people doesn't have all these facilities doesn't have bank accounts and all these things sometimes we know that only 80% of indians are covered in the bank so there are 20% and mostly it will be logical it will be in rural areas so they will not have a bank account so they ask them to put on their account and transfer the money to some other family members ultimately this results in extra charges for the bank correspondent that, that they say as a challenge and paragraph 20 and uh, lack of training this is another problem for banking correspondents especially on new products being launched so they can't take the services to the people so whenever a bank launches a new product there is no training for banking correspondents they doesn't know what is this product so ultimately that will not reach to the common man the benefit of the products or services will not reach the common man so that is the biggest problem here and so sometimes bad behavior of banking correspondents also there bad behavior ill treating the common man is also happens and as another most important thing which we need to understand from paragraph 22 that is uh, fiji digital fiji digital means uh, it's a strategy followed by banks so it's nothing but uh, balancing physical and digital transactions digital interactions so what the banks right now are doing in global level and also indian level is is finding a right balance of how using physical transaction and also digital transaction that's called fiji strategy which is being promoted across the world and right now india is also moving towards this this is called as new normal especially after this pandemic this word is very common in our life new normal that is reflected in banking system through this fiji digital okay and we'll see a question uh, for this topic we can't find a direct question in upsc but we try to take some other previous year questions and try to find some points and uh, last two years of questions uh, they are asking some basic technology and they are trying to relate how to empower the people's life uh, give a good, good example they'll ask what is nanotechnology how it is going to empower farmers or how it is going to empower poor section of the people so like this we need to understand whenever you study any topic on technology first we need to understand the common basic of the technology probably if they want to ask a question on fintech they'll ask what is fin fintech means then they go for how fintech is able to transform farmers life women's life so like that they can frame the questions 
So we can't find a perfect match on the question on fintech in UPSC question papers. We have taken some other question. It's way back 2015. So based on this question, they are asking about Digital India program and how to improve the farmer's life. And they are given very specifically on productivity and income. And what are the steps taken by the government in this regard? So Digital India is a digital program primarily focusing on creating the infrastructures and also creating the softwares to help the common man and this is especially focused on farmers and this type of questions what we can do is based on this article what we have gone through so we can write some of the facts how this jam trinity is working which applies for a common man which also applies for the farmers that we can relate it and also we can relate this banking correspondent model how this helps in financially empowering the rural masses which includes farmers but other specific thing, the order steps taken by the government in this dimension of productivity and income, we need to more focus on government initiative like ENAM and also we have this, uh, uh, ENAM is one initiative focusing on uh, so agriculture marketing. Similarly, we have the soil health card, all this we can relate here and give some specific government programs for it. And this question is regarding farmers. Similarly, this can be targeted on certain section of the population. It either can be women or AC, STs. So that we can relate with fintech. So for this question, the points based on the article, what we can uh, gone through is we can write the factual statements of ja Jam Trinity, and also we we already saw that a uh, lot of state government and union government schemes are being done through the Aadhaar enabled payment systems, and also we can relate with banking correspondent. Okay, thank you.